Arizona Wildlife Views, brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Welcome to Arizona Wildlife Views. I'm Jim Paxson, and this is Colorado. On today's show, we'll take you to the Phoenix Zoo to look at the latest facility dedicated to the recovery of the black-footed ferret. Then we'll go down south to see how ghouls turkeys are being managed for the future. Bass Pro Michael McFarland will give us another tip for catching big bass in Lake Pleasant. But first, let's go to the Huachuca Mountains and wrangle up some butterflies. Southern Arizona is a romantic region of stately saguaros, expansive cattle ranches, vineyards, and butterflies. Yes, butterflies. Southern Arizona is right smack in the migration path for the most colorful and most beautiful of all butterflies, the monarch. Monarch butterflies are the only insect to migrate up to 2,500 miles to get out of the cold weather and hibernate. Gail Morris led a group of school kids into the wilds on a tagging expedition to teach them a little about this winged jewel. We're going to try to get a little bit of the scales from their body. We talked about the importance of the monarch migration, and this is the time of their migration through Arizona. By tagging a monarch butterfly, we can see the movement of what direction they're going. These tagging expeditions have led to some surprising findings. Some monarchs will actually continue on their way outside of Mexico City to the overwintering grounds there. Other monarchs will go over to the coast of California. By tagging them, we could see which direction they're going from where, which area. Sometimes we'll be able to actually monitor them on their movement. Sometimes we'll tag one here and it'll move to another site where someone's tagging. We'll be able to see those movements, those corridors, so we could try to protect those corridors uh, to help preserve the monarch migration. Monarch butterflies go through four generations each year. The first three generations hatch from their cocoon state, also known as the pupa or chrysalis state, and live for up to six weeks. But the fourth generation continues to live on for up to six or eight months so that they can migrate to a warmer climate, hibernate, and then start a new first generation in the springtime. Today's trekkers have been fortunate to find some cocoons and caterpillars. Oh, that is so cool. But it's the adult monarch that provides the most fun. Christina Cellelli describes the swoop in the air method. I went to catch it uh, and it was landed and then it flew off and I swooped it in the air. Lucy Burton relied on a little more stealth. I just snuck up behind it and grabbed it in between the wings. It was really fun. And of course, some techniques defy explanation. Well, Gail, how are our junior taggers doing? They're doing great. They're doing just very exciting things. They're finding all kinds of butterflies. Monarch butterflies, like many butterflies, are indicator species. They tell us how healthy our environment is. We see the effects of changing weather patterns. We see the biggest effect from loss of habitat. There were years before we would see millions and millions of monarch butterflies. And both in the overwintering areas in Mexico and along the coast of California, those numbers are diminishing dr drastically. And we can't help them and see what's happening unless we know which directions they're flying through. And so that's part of what we're doing today. It's nature at her best today. Perfect day, perfect weather. And a perfect way to learn about nature while spending some quality time with your kid. You get time with your kids, quality time. You don't have uh, video games in the way and uh, noise from radios. In fact, where we're at right now, there's not even cell phone service, so you don't have to worry about any interruptions from your phones. And so I think it's a good time just to bond with your kids while you're learning and, and they're learning. But look what happened where the white dots are. So when you have white in the orange, we have a queen butterfly. So James, tell us why activities like this are so beneficial to learning. 
I think they're beneficial because you get that hands-on uh, exposure. Well, I know when I went through uh, biology classes and things like that, when you'd see pictures in a book and they meant pretty much nothing as soon as I walked out of the classroom. Out here, they're actually getting to see things and learning the difference between a chrysalis and a cocoon and you know what types of creatures do that. And I think that's what really makes these. In fact, I'm learning a lot out here even, you know, just uh, watching the kids learn. Whatever capture technique one has perfected, eventually you need to get the butterfly out of the net and attach the tag. Lucy Burton explains this delicate procedure. Well, it was on my fingernail, so I just slipped it on in between the little veins and it just stuck right on the little scales. Then I kind of held it there for a little bit and then I put it on my palm and it flew away. There we go. Well, that's the preferred release technique, but others are much more fun. So far in the Southwest Monarch study, we've had about 10 recoveries. Most of them have been in Mexico, but a few have been in California. We've also had a few monarchs that have spent the winter in the Phoenix area, and so we're always monitoring and looking at those. East of the Rockies, Monarch Watch has had thousands of recoveries. And so part of it is us learning where our monarchs go here. This is uncharted territory. So everyone here, the parents and students alike, are all being citizen scientists today, writing down their observations, what they see, and hopefully we'll find out where they go. Loss of habitat, pesticides, pollution, and the decline of milkweeds the caterpillars feed on are all believed to contribute to the decline of monarch numbers. A lot of times the monarch butterflies here like going to the thistles that you see. That's often one of their favorite nectar sources. While it may take considerable time to define the specific locations of these migration corridors, Gail has some ideas of how you can help. You could check the website, the southwestmonarchs.com. Uh, there's also a Facebook page for interest in Arizona. They can create their own way station in their backyard also by going to monarchwatch.org and look up monarch way stations. It'll give you an idea of the different milkweeds and different plants to grow in your backyard to invite them to visit your yard, and it works. In my yard right now in the Phoenix area, I have 22 caterpillars and I have another seven that are eggs right now just waiting to emerge. So if you plant it a, a lush banquet, they will come. Conservation is really about strong partnerships. And it takes like-minded institutions that bring their resources together for the common good of a goal. The Black-Footed Ferret Program, the recovery program, is a perfect example and a wonderful success story on how strong conservation programs can work for the good of a species. That's very important to us, having those partnerships and, and making things happen when everybody's working together. Partnership formed by the Arizona Game and Fish Department, the Phoenix Zoo, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Hualapai Nation, Navajo Nation, Arizona State Land Department, and the Choya Cattle Company is certainly making things happen for the black-footed ferret, one of the most threatened mammals in North America. It actually went extinct in the wild, um, and were it not for being able to collect last remaining 18 from the wild and start a breeding program back in the late 80s, they would have been gone forever. So they're also very important in the prairie because they actually manage population of prairie dogs. And prairie dogs play an important role in grassland by turning over soil and so on, but they can easily become a, a much less manageable population if there isn't a carnivore in place to help control their population. 
So inadvertently, what was happening as ranchers were getting rid of prairie dogs on their own, they were also making less food for ferrets. <laughs> and once there was less food for ferrets, they went, began to go extinct, and ultimately the prairie dog population exploded. So you ended up with a, you know, creating more of a problem than you're actually solving. Um, so ferrets play an, an integral role in managing you know, predator-prey relationships in the prairie. We think there's about 1,200 ferrets now existing in the wild. We're not sure about how, how many there are in Audrey Valley, but last year they had a record uh, number spotted during this, what they call the spotlighting. One of the most fun things that we do, and, and we have various staff and volunteers that go up twice a year to Aubrey, is the spotlighting events. Those are hugely fun. It's a little silly because you're driving around all night long at four miles an hour with million watt spotlights looking for that emerald green eye shine that only a ferret has. But when you find one, wow, the most endangered small mammal in North America. I mean, how cool is that to be able to actually see one in the wild? The Phoenix Zoo has been an active participant in the conservation and reintroduction of black-footed ferrets since the opening of their first breeding facility in 1992. Since then, uh, we've been involved with the Black Ferret Ferret Breeding Program, and we've averaged 20 ferrets born here every year uh, since 1992. And we're really pleased to have been involved with this program all of this time. Aiding the recovery of the species is the opening of the new Black-Footed Ferret Breeding Center at the Phoenix Zoo. With help from a generous donation from the Arthur L. and Elaine V. Johnson Foundation, this new facility will enable the Phoenix Zoo to continue their successful breeding program. It's amazing. It's so much nicer than the older one that we were in for almost 20 years. One of the wonderful things about this facility is the actual large room where the, where the ferrets are housed is bigger than the entire building that we used to have that encompassed all of our activities. Now we have that large room just for ferrets, but we have a separate treatment room, for instance, for the hospital staff when they come down, if we have a ferret that needs medical care. This is a quarantine facility, so ferrets don't leave here to go to the hospital as another animal might. The hospital team comes to us. We have a fully serviced um, treatment room. We've got tables. We have an anesthesia machine. We have special lights. Everything we need to take care of. And that's separate. We can close it off. And that's a huge luxury. We also have enormous amounts of storage, which is, as anybody knows, anywhere in any office or any home, that's just a boon. We also have um, a great big office area with um, food prep area. We've got a place to do our lab work. During breeding season, there's a fair amount of slides that we have to look at. We've got a workstation. We have laundry facilities. We've got a beautiful big freezer for our food. So we just have space. We can spread out and we've got room to expand. As one of only six facilities in the world that participate in the species breeding program, the Phoenix Zoo has produced 400 ferrets, 85 of which have been released in the Aubrey Valley. Through the auspices of the Arthur L. Johnson and Elaine Johnson Foundation, they have built for us not only our original conservation building, but this gorgeous new facility for black-footed ferrets um, that just opened in November. Elaine's nickname is Gabby, so we felt it only fair that we name our very first female kit, and it turned out to be our very first kit this year in the new building, Gabby. So that's where the name comes from. Right. We've worked hard on this project for a very long time. It's almost 20 years for us now. Uh, next year it will be our 20th anniversary in the program. And I think for us, one of the really special aspects of it has been our ability to work with the game and fish folks and the fish and wildlife folks up at the release site in Aubrey. Having that connection and having the ability to see and really work with both sides of this kind of a program is such a privilege and it's so much fun to be able to see the babies here, raise them up, and then maybe two years down the road be spotlighting in Aubrey 
and find that ferret um, and see that you know it it got out there and it did its job and it's still surviving and it's doing well I, that you just can't put a price on that the ultimate goal of every endangered species program is to be able to remove that species from the federal endangered species list with the growth of the wild black-footed ferret population in arizona we've moved ever closer to achieving that ultimate goal. The black-footed ferret was very nearly lost forever, but thanks to conservationists with a passion, the black-footed ferret now roams wild in Arizona. With the support of our partners, especially partners like the Phoenix Zoo, and funding from the Heritage Fund, we will continue to work towards a full recovery of this magnificent species. It's a great, great day. Grab that blanket on the porch. Two blankets on the porch. The guys from Arizona Game and Fish had been baiting some turkeys. The 200,000 turkeys been trapped in North America that will be released in another location here this morning so that we will be expanding Goose wild turkey population for the future. You got it. Today is a really special day since we're taking the 200,000th turkey and releasing it in the state of Arizona, which is absolutely awesome. And it being of the Gould subspecies, one of the five subspecies in North America, it's a very special day for a lot of people who put in a lot of effort in order to make this happen. And, you know, and I look over my career, today was just as special as it was back then. The passion to be outside, to see a wild turkey, one of the most magnificent creatures in the world, to be able to come in and know that we're going to take these and move them to another place, start new populations that future generations and kids can enjoy, whether they hunt them or go see them. And this passion is, is in us to be able to go do that. The reason we do translocations is we want to expand wild turkeys. And if you go back and look around the turn of the century, we had about 30,000 wild turkeys. Now we've got about 7 million. Okay. I, got, I got number six. And the only way we have new turkey populations is to catch existing birds that know how to survive in the wild and move them to a new location so we can expand turkey populations. Now we've got over 1,000 turkeys here in Arizona that are ghouls subspecies, seven million in the country. So this is how we move turkeys and make new populations. If you just hold them kind of firmly, but not too tight. And so they get their head in the Yep, that's good, just like that. Yeah. Just be 
right. the rest if you can. Martin, can you help them put them in the box when you got them in? Yeah, which one? Take with the Yeah, that's a rough spot. Put the feet down in first, the feet in first. Ready? Hang on, this one's got to go in. <laughs> I think she's glad she has the hat on, actually. <laughs> As a parent, uh, there is no greater feeling in the world than to have a child out in the outdoors with you um, when you're either hunting or you're doing volunteer work. But to have her here today was truly special to myself and my wife. My wife had to work today uh, or else she would have been right here with us. Um, she's very much looking forward to seeing pictures of Rhea uh, holding her first turkey that she's trapped. But the concept of her working as a conservationist at the age of five to help and trap those turkeys to release them into different locations so that there is a strong population for her and her colleagues as they grow up through the system to be able to hunt is an absolutely phenomenal feeling. What you got there? One ghoul's turkey. This whole event is totally funded by sportsmen's dollars. Their license that they buy to go hunt uh, is part of what pays for this and the excise tax on the arms and ammunition that they buy upon the opportunity for us to go move wild turkeys. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have the wildlife we have in this country. Sportsmen paid for it with their dollars, self-imposed taxes, and so this is why we're going to be able to have this legacy for the future. It was paid for, not by federal dollars, not by tax dollars other than on sportsmen, so that we'll have wildlife for years to come. I'm real excited to release the 200,000 birds of the National Wild Turkey Federation uh, program. I want to personally thank Arizona Game and Fish, all of our volunteers in Arizona, because without you, this program would not be possible. And I just really appreciate all you've done for Arizona. fish that we have back here that we've been trying to catch is very difficult because it's inside of the tree. All right? So when I pitch a bait inside of the tree, I don't get the good hook set and I've got all that debris in the tree itself to pull the fish back through. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you a really cool rig that will swim away from you. This is a great bait to pitch to docks because it will swim up underneath the docks. My goal here will be to put this bait on, pitch to the outside of the bed and it should swim into the fish. Now it'll leave me the opportunity to set the hook without having all the trees and limbs in my way. The first thing I'm gonna do is tie an owner EWG, extra wide gap, 
I like to use a uni knot. This is a five odd extra wide gap. And I'm just gonna use a simple uni knot with about seven twists, okay? Always wet your line before you tighten it, okay? Check your knot, give it a good pull, seems good. When I trim my tag, I leave usually about an eighth of an inch. That way if there's any slipping, that tag has some room to slip. So now I have a weightless owner EWG, okay? I'm now going to take a Yamamoto Fat Ica. Normally this rig would be, as we just fished it, rigged this way. I'm gonna rig it in reverse, okay? I'm gonna take this bait and I'm going to Texas rig it, just like any worm. Now here's the trick. Once this bait's rigged, Texas rigged, okay? I'm going to take a nail weight and I'm gonna insert that nail weight into the butt, okay? Now when I throw this bait in the water, it'll swim away from me. Well, that's our show for tonight. Be sure and check our website for more information on Arizona Game and Fish and anything you've seen in tonight's episode. I'm Jim Paxson with producers Gary Schaefer and Carol Lynn. We'll see you next week.